So the reason I have this talk to begin with is because I keep having the same sorts of conversations. So I talk to HPC people, they have assumptions about how the systems work. I talk to cloud people, they have assumptions how the systems work, and they're different. So trying to design solutions in those spaces is difficult when you're making different assumptions. So I've been spending a lot of my time trying to figure out how to put together paradigms that work that still give us the niceties that we have in the cloud today. So who am I? Cloud software architect. I'm also a CNCF environmental sustainability tag chair. So if you want to talk to about sustainability, I have that too. I don't know how that's going to work in HPC type systems, but we'll see. Um, so quick poll. Who here has experienced in HPC? Who here has experienced in cloud specifically? Who has both? So fewer hands, right? So if you've ever been in a room where you have both and one party speaking Greek and the other's Latin, it's hard to translate. So one of the things that I have rants about continually is that we can pull from different thought patterns. So here's Anthony and On a Pale Horse. I know this is a very old book, um, but he had five different thought patterns. So he had linear, parallel, creative, circular, and intuitive. And if you look at these, the first two apply often to what cloud people assume, which is linear, they, they're not looking at parallel. And the second one is the parallel, which is what a lot of cloud uh, compute us. So we're gonna start with a generic example of an HPC system. Um, so you have you know, compute nodes, you have some sort of ingress, which is usually one giant login node, and you have your storage. You have some assumptions that come from this. So starts with infrastructure is, is mutable. So users are assuming fine grade control. So you have MPI, you have NUMA nodes, you have CPU pinning, and you have memory pinning. This gives you access to compute resources that are usually handled by a resource manager in a scheduling system, and options exist for common patterns. Your users are often system experts which means they understand infrastructure, they have a tolerance for complexity, and they think in terms of parallel compute. So it's the type of people that are using your HPC systems are usually very well versed in how these systems work. Users own the compute nodes. There aren't other, other things scheduled there. So users, usually there's exclusive access to all the resources on those nodes. Security is handled through very strict access to the cluster itself, and the rules within the cluster is very widely. So I've seen very open systems and I've seen very closed systems depending on what you're doing. The second one's harder to run on. And at the end of the run, the resources are made available to other jobs. You no longer own them. Additionally, uh, most of these systems are homogenous, at least from the old world. So the HPC applications usually assume that the nodes have at the very least a very similar setup. So that means the same hardware, the same BIOS, the same OS, the same drivers, the same firmware, and the same software infrastructure. There are tools that look for inconsistencies, for instance, Intel Cluster Checker, I'm at Intel. I also used to work on this project. And I will tell you, sometimes we would get reports where people would send in very long logs of what they would get out of these tools. And the thing that was wrong with their cluster was they would have different ethernet drivers. That's it, that was killing their performance. Then we get into cloud systems. You have some CPUs, they're in some nodes. You don't know necessarily a lot about the rest of the system. Sometimes in particular systems you may, but with cloud, that's not the normal assumption. Your user base is different. Your users desire simplicity. They don't wanna know the details. They're not systems experts. They may have never racked a machine. Who here has racked a machine? This is not, it, who here hasn't? Who here hasn't that mostly does uh, Kubernetes and not HPC? So, and users often do not think in terms of parallel applications. They know only about their specific application. They can ask for a, num a number of CPUs or a set of resources and maybe define parameters, but they don't always know what they are getting, so the requests aren't always helpful. 
And I've seen entire teams at various companies that their whole purpose in life is to figure out how to save money on cloud because they're wasting resources. So, um, and I was on one of those teams at one point, and we, you know, one flaw would be $10,000 a month. The users share notes. This introduces jitter. This blows through your bandwidth and hurts reliability, and scaling doesn't always work correctly in this case. They're also heterogeneous. Your machines can be anything. You have different CPUs, different speeds, different NICs, and different memory, and they all behave differently. So the scaling doesn't always work. The machines are less stable, which means the workloads sometimes are assumed to be able to auto reschedule. And the compute is considered to be robust instead of the hardware. So let's talk about some positive patterns in Kubernetes, because there are some things in the cloud we want to keep. And one of them is things like device plugins. So the device plugin is very simple. You have a device manager, you have some devices on the, a device plugin on the nodes, you have various devices that get lifted into the pods that you then are able to use. This is really neat. It's easy to write, it's easy to use. You have gRPC, it's pretty quick. Once you get the resources in, it's not the startup usually that's hurting you. And you can usually track the health of the devices. There are some limitations with device plugin. You don't have any specific understanding about the devices behind, beyond healthy and not healthy. And so, because I'm part of sustainability, um, other things that we look at are power use, voltage, temperature, bandwidth, which isn't really sustainability, but it's other items. There is one thing that I would really like to see fixed in Kubernetes, and that is this herd of managers. So Alexander Konevsky, I don't know if you talked to him, he goes by Sasha, he's also at Intel. He calls this a herd of managers. So if you go inside the kubelet, there are four managers. You have topology manager, memory manager, CPU manager, and device manager. And all of these have to talk to each other as far as scheduling resources so that they're in this right NUMA zone. And this doesn't even work correctly in most cases. Um, and so you have to have them talking to each other. Anytime you make changes or updates, you now have to make sure it works with all of your managers. What do we want to keep from Kubernetes? We want to separate the average user from systems knowledge. There is no reason for a u average user to continue to have to know intricate details of your system. And they don't want to. So if you look at where people are going, they're going to AIML because they don't have to necessarily. You have these very bright mathematician type minds that are going into cases where they don't have to know systems knowledge. You want to keep pluggable infrastructure. You want to make it easy for the admins to put in any type of infrastructure. It's even better if users can toggle their own options according to their workload profiles and make more things available. We still have scheduling issues. So we have kubatch, which allows batch scheduling. This is wonderful, similar to HPC. It's used in a variety of systems. Um, we've already referenced it today. It does not solve the issue of guaranteeing node consistency or of the firmware, the OS, the BIOS, et cetera. So you're still gonna get the performance issues I referenced with cluster, when we were using cluster checker, when we would find ethernet drivers being disparate. Um, Intel has a project called telemetry aware scheduling, which allows scheduling according to node metrics. So you could actually look for things like this on your node, but the metrics are currently node only, which we're trying to fix so you can pull things off the node as well. Um, and it's also internal to Intel, so we still have to upstream it. There's also network-aware scheduling. This was a neat project put out by IBM Labs. Um, it uses a cluster's network latency and topo topological information to better schedule latency and bandwidth-sensitive workloads. There's no guarantee, though, if the co-located pods kills initial assumptions. So if you have a co-located co pod and it suddenly starts using a bunch of bandwidth, you're stuck. So it still doesn't really solve this problem. And various people have tried to solve this problem. They run into the same thing. Um, what do we want from scheduling that we don't have today? We want guarantees of node behavior for a duration of a workload. This is from HPC. You have guarantees of node behavior. You want guarantees of network behavior for the duration of the workload. And you may want guarantees of compatible versions of software in the node. That includes all your BIOS settings and your Ethernet settings. 
Um, HPC, we also have checkpointing. We don't want to get rid of that. It's available for most ML pipelines, but it's not default at this point. Um, apparently, 125 for containers. There's now a new checkpointing thing. I haven't played with it. I don't know if anyone else here has, but that looks promising as far as keeping checkpoints for more advanced things. We want native CPU management users can control. So all advanced solutions are currently out of tree. You have Nokia CPU cooler, you have CRRM. I've talked to people that are actually running their own daemons on the nodes. The kubelet options must be turned off in order for these to work. So all those managers that I showed you earlier, you have to turn things off. Um, we've done some tests in turning these off and playing with some CPU management, and we're getting over a three times speed up, which is better use of resources and um, with our CPU management over current Kubernetes. This is the thing that we're running, in case you're curious. Um, I'm happy to talk about this. This will come out in about two weeks, three weeks maybe, open source internal to Intel. Um, so we've, we've basically made it so that we can have uh, mixed cores. So you can have pinned cores and non-pinned cores, and we're adding ISIL CPU type cores as well. So I'd like to see the kubelet move something more to this model here. So basically have a plug-in so that these managers are pluggable instead of having external. And we do have some preliminary work on this. Other things we don't have, we don't have guaranteed networking bandwidth with network topology. We still have the dual NIC per node. You either have to channel bond or you have to do weird things with Multis and we've, and it's very, uh, hand done in order to do that. Um, we want something faster than the current MPI operator in Kubeflow, maybe using a direct fabric between pods, maybe using libfabric, which is an HPC tool for, for the base, so you still have the fast fabric between. We have other factors still. There's file and block and container attached storage. Some of those container attached solutions require a core outside of Kubernetes just to run because they're running clients all the way through. They're interesting. Um, we need to be looking at other run times. Wasm is getting popularity. We're going to have to deal with it. Um, Singularity is also an HPC specific container. I don't know if anyone's used that. It's pretty neat as a project, but it's not really mainstream. So anything doing container D isn't going to handle that. And then there's two last things we're going to talk about real quickly. One thing is we want to update the math. So once upon a time, people put together PS3s, because they're cheap, especially at the time compared to the compute nodes. So they made all these clusters out of PlayStation 3s. What they found was that the floating point operations were different. So they're not necessarily following IEEE standards. And instead of infinity or negative infinity, sometimes they would just peg the numbers at either end, which isn't really what you're going for. And it's also very slow on certain types of floating point compute. But if you're using different processors, how do you do the math? Because the numbers you're coming out may not be consistent for your same processors. So this is something where we have to get a little bit more robust. And this is, I'm calling this a side quest, but this is because I don't think we have everything we need today as far as what we need to be thinking about with compute. Because we need to break out of correctness and efficiency only. That's what we've been doing with software for forever. We want things as efficient, we want things correct, but we don't have any robustness whatsoever. So today, reliability is a hardware problem, almost exclusively. A desirability is a software problem. So if you go to this guy's lectures, one of the, this particular paper, he goes through, this is one of my old professors, so I have a place dear and true to him. Um, he actually took quick merge and bubble sort and put in random events where it would give the wrong answer. The only one that really converged on a correct answer was bubble sort. And we all know bubble sort is very slow, but we need to start thinking in terms of how to make things correct, at least at the micro level, and start falling towards correctness. And that's the sum of this. So thanks for listening. Thank you. Do you have any questions? What's the uh, the name of this uh, CPU management 
software that's going to be released? Do you have like an estimate for you know when we'll be able to take a look at it? It'll be two to three weeks. We're calling it the CPU manager control plane because it's a control plane. <laughs> All right, thank so. you. And you're, you're welcome to contact me after and I can send you an email as soon as we release. Any other questions? Sorry, just quickly, and I, it's just, you mentioned singularity there, and that's something that we've used a lot ourselves, but we found that the like, there doesn't even seem to be any real desire in the Kubernetes world to take that up. Like there was right. the singularity CRI, but that was dropped like two years ago. And I'm just curious if you've seen that, no. any interest anywhere. Yeah, I, I mean, so CRM, they have, they have uh, solutions for CPU within the runtime, um, and they're trying to add in class-based resources into the kubelet. The, the shortcoming of this is you're still going to have issues where you have different runtimes. So as people try to introduce different runtimes, and Singularity is a very nice HPC runtime, it's not going to address that. So I really think we need to be looking out of just runtime solutions, because they're, they're very good for what they do, but also be looking outside of that and have lighter, pluggable managers so we can plug and play them according to user needs. Cool. Makes sense. Thanks. Hi, in your talk you also talked about the three times performance improvements, but usually in this world nothing comes for free. So what kind of trade-offs did you have to do for that? Can you say that again? I didn't understand. In your talk you were talking about uh, achieving a three times performance improvement, mm -hmm. but in this world usually nothing comes for free. So what kind of trade-offs did you have to do for that? So we were pinning pods. Um, so we were pinning particular pods in partic particular areas. So we got, and there's a talk about this later, but we went from 48% to over 70% use of the cores instead of the normal. So we, we were using hotel reservation for the, that particular one. So there's particular benchmarks. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I have a related follow-up uh, on mm -hmm. the CPU management and the pinning. Mm -hmm. uh, is this uh, aware of all the resources on the node? For example, could you uh, do the um, collocate TPU, CPU, things like this? Or? Currently, it's CPU only. But with we're look the way we're doing the pluggableness, we're trying. We're hoping that we can s we can expand beyond this. This was just a first cut, so we've been working on this since about January. It's not a long project. Right. So, so it's CPU manager, but it can be aware of other resources. As Absolutely. Well. Okay. Cool. Yeah. We have. Plenty of time for more questions. If um, I actually have one one question. Um, mm -hmm. So this was a great summary of like you know um, all the things that we should be considering for HPC on Kubernetes or a missing point. What do you think about storage? Like I don't know if you've like touched if you. Um, Look into that more deeply. And um. so storage is a the the thing about storage is you want to get your compute as close to your node as possible. And we weren't doing that in HPC necessarily because we had our, our storage on the Lustre file system, right, going across a huge network. Um, so you know, Intel had Optane memory, which you could put it on the node and, and preload. Um, and that's that's really the way the storage solutions that I've seen are cur currently working. So if you look at Weka, they have different clients, they have a client per NIC, basically, and they, they push it across, trying to put it co-located. So I think storage may need some more design. Some of the cool things that I've seen, one of them was out of Western Digital. They actually are doing modifications in the storage. They have compute in the storage. So maybe that we shift some of the compute into the storage itself and do micro, micro changes for when you just have to do plus one or do some sort of update and then do something else as far as on-node compute. But that will require more sophisticated, pluggable approach. Like yep. When do you upload, when do you do not, how do you express it on this spec? Right, okay. and currently it's not particularly clean, and I agree with you, we need to get a little bit better on that.
Okay, I guess we, I think we have a break now. Here's one. Here's one. one more. Uh, what's the state of like accelerator devices and you know kernel driver support on the host system versus going into the container and everything else? Like, uh, is is there any new research working on that to sort of bypass uh, a lot of the the OS kernel? Is it try to bypass what? So um, you were saying before, uh, uh, you know, better networking and MPI. Mm -hmm. you have for the GPU layer, the RDMA, yeah. uh, GPU direct communication. Um, is there anything that can be brought over from HPC land into, into Kubernetes that's being done today that, that you, you can comment on? Yeah, so if you look at some of the backends, so I'm familiar with the Habana infrastructure, they have the backend network. So they actually have direct GPU to GPU behavior. So we can, we can borrow from that. Um, if you're doing things, but it's, you're still gonna have the piece where you still have the CPU and trying to get the memory over. So I think we need to start reimagining, to be honest, as far as how we build these structures, but there's pieces of Kubernetes I don't wanna lose, including simplicity, because it's, these systems are very complicated, so users just don't wanna, don't wanna deal with that level of complexity. But you're right, we should be looking more on that, um, but those are mostly the, you have to look at the training jobs. The training, the training cards are the ones that are specific with the back end. I'm sure NVIDIA has something similar. I don't know, though. Kind of curious if you've seen any solutions about network, because this is often a, a common thing, because, you know, m nodes are multi-tenant. They're not sole tenant, so you get like bursty behavior, starvation, and sometimes ultimately node unhealthiness. Um, so one of the things I would like to do is make it so that you have a driver basically sitting there monitoring your pod behavior, and if something is blowing through the network, you reschedule that pod. Um, but we don't really have anything like that. So we have things that look at current state, but you still need a monitoring component behind there that's rescheduling. So we can do something similar to what we do with telemetry aware scheduling and play with that. And that's one of the projects that I have on my long list of backlog <laughs> projects. Um, but then start monitoring the network behavior. But you have to monitor it as it goes because as long as you have multi-tenancy, you're gonna have that issue. I, I think we have a talk uh, later today as well on network QoS. <clears throat> when you talk about rescheduling things, um, mm. there's going to be a, a lot of complexity with local data. <clears throat> so moving a, uh, a pod off a node could mean that it's completely starting from the, from scratch. Right. So this is where we need the checkpoint, the checkpointing pieces. So we just now have checkpointing of pods. So I would. So I think at this point because we have that now, we can probably start to look to leverage. So we can start checkpointing the pods and then save the state somewhere so that if we have to deschedule and reschedule, you can start from the current run state. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Well, any other question for Merle? Otherwise, thank you very much again. Thank you.